everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas. And we are back for another exciting episode. You probably recognize this wonderful lady here today, Dr. Rebecca Jorgensen. She is one of the founders of Try EFT in the San Diego Center of EFT in San Diego, California. And she travels the world, actually, not just the States, but the world, teaching other therapists about EFT. And she's brilliant. She has many excellent training resources and tapes, which we'll talk about at the end. But Dr. Jorgensen's agreed to come back and talk to us today about shame. As we know, that is one of those really tough emotions that pops up in our sessions and can become kind of hard to understand how to work with. So she's going to help us with that today. So thank you again, Becca, for have, for coming back on the show and, and talking to us about this. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. So could you kind of, you know, introduce everyone to maybe a, a definition in some way of shame? Yeah, so I'm, I think of shame as an experience of pain that comes from social rejection or abandonment that's received in response to an expressed attachment need. And repeated experiences of um, shame result in us defining ourselves as unlovable or unworthy. So I've tried to make a definition that mm -hmm. puts attachment in there because shame is really um, bred, born and bred, from attachment experiences of rejection or isolation, abandonment. And so rejection could, because oftentimes we see clients who, uh, I mean, obviously shame is of themselves, but they don't necessarily automatically go to someone else shaming them. They're often judging themselves and shaming themselves and seeing themselves as unworthy. And can you tell us how, you know, I guess what I've seen is it, with the rejection piece, something about somebody along the way told them that what they're doing or thinking or feeling is unacceptable or wrong. Can you, can you talk more yeah, about it's that? not just any rejection. I mean, social rejection hurts. Social rejection causes pain. But this is rejection in the face of expressing an attachment need. Mm -hmm. And so we're in emotion you know, movement and emotion of this expression of need, of belonging. And, um, and then that gets interrupted. <laughs> um, so not only are we surprised, shocked, startled, but this feedback comes that what we're asking or seeking is bad, it's wrong, um, because it gets so rejected or, um, or ignored, really. So... I mean, being ignored is another way of being rejected. So how we cope, one of the ways that we cope with that is we start to, when that happens multiple times in um, our environments, that we start to disown those needs. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that we can disown those needs is reject them ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so that prevents us, it protects us from moving towards another and then get slapped, kind of emotionally slapped in that same way. And it's much better if I can, I can control it then by right. reducing my own need, rejecting my need, like I'll, I can beat you to the punch. And then I'm geared up, I'm ready, prepared, mm -hmm. and it, what you do can't hurt me as much because I've already taken care of it. Let me see if I can drop some context into this because obviously shame is so can be very, very complex. And I've had this come up a few times. I'm thinking of, of a more recent example I've seen pop up with a few clients where, you know, they're trying to blend families, um, you know, couples who are remarrying and they bring children into the marriage. And they often talk about, you know, single parenting, it's so lonely, it's so hard, but yet I'm integrating with my new fiance, my new husband, spouse, partner, whoever, and yet I don't feel like I can tag them in to help me parent my unruly teenager because when they act out, I'm judging myself as 
this is a reflection of me being a bad parent. And when I've gone into that, it's, well, when I was trying to get help from one of my parents, when I was younger and struggling, they told me I was a bad mom. And so it's like, you can't ask for help because you're a bad mom. And if you don't do, you know, if you don't do it on your own, then you're a bad mom. And so anything bad that happens, it's because you're a bad mom and you can't ask for help because other people are thinking you're a bad mom. So if you just tell yourself that you don't have to reach for others and hear that from them, does, does that kind of sound like a... Like well, that's a really complex situation that you're describing because you already have a bunch of loyalty conflicts come up yeah. and um, whether kids will respond to a new parental figure or not. You know, the research would actually say that that parent is wise mm -hmm. to be in charge of the discipline in a new relationship mm -hmm. um, and let the, have the new parent come in as a friend and develop that rather than trying to pass over Mm -hmm. um, parental duties to them, so or even just um, in general, like, we, we can, uh, like I find they struggle to even open up to their new partners about parenting struggles because they feel so ashamed, and they they were able to actually say the word shame. Like I'm so ashamed of my parenting that I've not been the best parent because I was single for a long time and got pregnant as a teenager or whatever. You know, I've, I've heard seen this so many times. And it, it, it's certainly one context that people can feel ashamed. What we feel like we produced as a reflection on us, whether that's kids or work in our job or our own relationship. Yeah. Where you know where, where when it comes back to us, what's what's reflected back to us mm -hmm. is um, something that looks broken. Yeah. Because when we already have this determination that our needs are bad and um, that we're already defined as unlovable or un unworthy, Worthy. then any of those kind of reflections that come back to us that say, see, you're actually, it's true, you're not enough, you are broken, yeah. makes us very sensitive. We're very sensitive to that kind of feedback. Yeah. When we're very shame prone. Yeah. Right? So and then that happens on a continuum. Mm -hmm. And when we're really, when we have a a big amount of shame, then we're more sensitive and we're, we can on that continuum be much more shame prone. So then most any reflection that comes back to us that says, that's not a good enough job. You didn't do that well enough. Um, that's your fault creates a great deal of sensitivity to us and, and creates this motion of hiding, you know, because Emotion has that movement connected to it and the action tendency with shame. Of course, I think people are mostly aware of that is to hide. The tricky part is that shame isn't, it's not its own, it's not its, its own emotion. It's actually a mixed emotion. It's a, a sticky, I like to call it a sticky emotion because other very um, attachment oriented attachment affect are connected to shame. So you don't, shame doesn't show up without both sadness or regret and fear. So it sticks to these other primary emotions. And one of our problems, I think as therapists in working with it is kind of knowing which, where to go, what to do, because it is so sticky and we can get stuck in the midst of, you know, where do we go to work? What do we do with it? What, because um, you can't just go always directly to the shame. Right. People will block you from that. Right, and and I want to go more into that. But one of one of the things I also noticed is, you know, as you mentioned, shame shame is a I want to call this a bond blocker. <laughs> when you when you're immersed in shame, or when I see my clients immersed in shame, you know, because they're they're kind of self shaming them themselves they won't reach to their partner. They won't open up and say, I need you, or you know, it would feel less lonely if I could share this with you or talk about it with you. And it, it, it ends up leaving them out of a moment where they could have had an opportunity to bond and get closer and, and carry the load together because they're feeling too ashamed to reach out. Did you say bond blocker? A bond blocker. <laughs> bond blocker, oh. 
Mm. The bonding or the yeah, bonding it blocks, locker. It blocks so many things. Not only the bond, but right. it blocks mm -hmm. connecting and sharing in lots of lots of contexts. Mm -hmm. It blocks us from reaching and exploring even our own experiences. Yeah, from bonding because the identity related to it is to hide, and we do that by dismissing, by avoiding, by minimizing or by deflecting, you know, projecting it onto others. Yeah, yeah, I kind of think of bonding like sharing and connecting are all bonding, bonding producing behaviors. <laughs> That's just my silly way of looking at it. But let's talk about, so I like how you said, it's very important that you can't always, some, some clients are, I think it's more rare than not, some clients are good at identifying they have shame, but it feels like for the most part, most clients don't. So how would we be able to identify that, that that might be in there? And would we be more likely to see this in stage one? Would it be more obvious in stage two? Or? Well, it's, I think it's obvious in both. Once you are attuned to it, hearing it, knowing what you're looking for, it can become obvious. But just that like stage one and stage two, we're going to do something different with it because our intention is different. Our intention in stage one is all about de-escalation. And our intention in stage two is about creating these new bonding events so people are experiencing deeper, showing up in a different way, able to own a lot more of their inner world, explore their inner world differently. So one of the things that we can really look for is, um, I mean, we listen a lot to language, but we really can watch a lot of nonverbals as well because Shame has a posture that tends to go with it, and it can look a lot like sadness because it is a um, sticky emotion, and sadness is right there along with it. Sad can also have this kind of downtrodden, you know, um, curled up a little bit expression of looking down. Um, but the posture of shame is very much like, um, you know, like bad dog, <laughs> like. When, when you see somebody scold their dog and the dog goes, oh, you know, and um, the shoulders come down, you kind of curl up and in, um, and this hang dog look. So uh, one of the things we can watch for is that expression that happens, um, and then remembering that shame is sticky, and it that sadness is on one edge of it, and fear of those longings and needs, what rejection or abandon might come, might come up with it or right there. So we want to watch for, of course, language. Um, and as we're getting, going through the process of emotion with people, so we're getting what's the danger, what's their catastrophic fear, how does that come up into their body, what do we see in the bodily responses, and then we go to the meaning making, right? The reappraisal. We're going to listen for those. I'm broken. I'm bad. I'm no good. Or my partner sees me as less than. And sometimes they talk about feeling really small. And kind of um, in TA, people would talk about the parent-child relationship. You're up here. I'm way down here. Mm -hmm. um, so we're watching for those kinds of things that indicate curling up. Um, disowning and having to do with feeling uh, broken and not good enough and some people can't talk about it it's very hard to get in touch with and some people lead with this I'm bad and everybody sees me as bad and they'll they let us know right up front that that's uh, problematic to them right and then the action tendency of course is to hide so we're watching for that can they talk about it can they share it um, can they, what do they talk about? Do they get dismissive? Or when you can really curl up and just get lost in the pain of shame, one of the things that is very functional doesn't help the relationship a lot. But if I'm afraid that I'm going to get stuck down in this deep, dark pit of brokenness where I feel terrible about myself, anger is kind of the only emotion that pulls people up and out of that. And that often looks like blame. So one of the biggest things that I see our, our couple therapists struggle with is misidentifying a withdrawer because they get angry. 
because what they're withdrawing from is this pain of feeling broken and they come out and get mad and blame the other. It's like, I'm going to disown it so much, I'm going to make it about you. But it really keeps it hidden. It's like a very um, smart way, unconsciously smart way to stay away from this pit of awful feeling that people would otherwise get stuck in. Well, withdrawers aren't the only ones who feel shame, right? No, but it's, it's, it's often easier for us to hear that in our pursuers, right? Yeah. So they want to tell us about it. They want to tell us about feeling alone and not having their needs and people telling them that their needs aren't okay and that they feel this small, you know, like that they have it, but the way that they cope with it is often different. Because of the fear that's right there about I'm going to be member of shame's connected to the broken feeling connected both to grief and sadness and the fear um, of rejection or abandonment and with and pursuers lead with that fear of I'm going to be left alone. I don't want to be left alone in this awful feeling. So not that it's any easier for them to feel it or to stay with it, but they'll often let us know about it easier. Yeah. So I, I love what I hear you saying is that oftentimes this will look like one person talking about feeling broken, feeling unworthy in some way, um, and they really tend to tuck their needs or their concerns away, kind of hide it away from their partner. But not, not every withdrawer has shame. I don't want people to get confused that withdrawing is a sign of shame, feeling shame, but um, shame but is... There's other other emotions that have the, you know, because withdrawing itself, avoidant attachment itself is about suppressing and repressing emotion. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily just about hiding. That is one of the things that happens when I'm trying to suppress or repress emotion is that, you know, it gets dismissed, it gets smaller, I don't make as big of a deal out of it. But the intention isn't just to hide it. The intention is let me cope. Let me cope with this bad feeling by not making the feeling so bad. I'll look on the bright side. You know, I'm not going to pay a lot of attention to it. I'm going to think about other things. And so that's a very different action tendency than let me hide it over. Yeah. Right. And so when there's a lot of shame, you, we can either see this really collapsed state or this really agitated state mm -hmm. that, you know, like, ooh, like, yeah. stay away from me. Yeah. I may be blaming you, but my intention is a push away, right? It's not a person. It's not a pursuer poke. Like, see me, see me. Come, come. Know what's happening inside of me, right? It's like, oh, I'm, I, I'm hiding and I'm pushing you away. It protects me. It keeps that action tendency of hiding up and going. Let's say you have an extremely defensive and guarded um, pursuer who has a lot of shame, or who has shame, but. You have a hard time accessing it or getting them to even like like you suspect it's there but they just put up so many defenses how can you get underneath the defenses to access the shame well with our with your pursuer if so we're always looking on this continuum mm -hmm. right and the pursuers who are protesting for more disconnection and sometimes when the connection starts to come their way then they say, I don't know what to do with it, or it will shift from view of self to view of other. Mm -hmm. And that often happens much later in stage two with our pursuers. So we all have shame. We all have it. It's whether how much it's controlling the negative cycle. So many times in stage two, we're going to find elements of that view of self and view of other that's going to move from, you know, I have a positive view of you or have a negative view of you, why don't you just come be with me? I see you as capable, come be with me, right? That's why I'm protesting to, uh-oh, now I don't know actually how to do it. Do I deserve it? Is it going to be okay? What's wrong with me that I didn't um, know how to ask you to come close to me before? So many times when we get deeper into stage two, that just emerges because of the depth that we're working. When we're working really deep in stage two, we're starting to work with the construction of self, the identity construction. Right. So shame as an emotion 
often isn't the thing that's running the show with the pursuers, but we will find elements of that. Now, and pursuers do, I'm certainly we will have pursuers where shame is a really big part because it's sticking to their fear of abandonment, it's sticking to their sadness and their loneliness. But again, they often will tell you that it's there in stage one. I, mean, I can think of many, many couples, and I'll just tell you an example of one. Um, and the first thing she said is, we're here because something's the matter with me. I can't get over my childhood sexual abuse. I just can't get over with it. Something's wrong with me. I can't get over it. So often, kind of because of the expansion of emotion when it's under-regulated, that pursuers can tap into these different emotional veins and kind of know about them, have them kind of identified most of the time, because that's what happens when emotion gets bigger. Mm -hmm. um, people, and so it's more like I'm afraid to be alone in this, but it doesn't mean I know how to sit with it, that I know how to share it, that I know how to be soothed by it, but, uh, but pursuers will often let you in that it's there because the fear is I'm going to be alone in all of this. And if I'm in, alone in all of this, that actually proves that I'm unlovable. So come be with me. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking of, of one very complex case that I had, and I couldn't get it from the pursuer that there was shame. I only got it once, and it took me like eight months to even. I, I couldn't crack the case. <laughs> I couldn't crack the case. It was a really hard case. And I knew there was something I was missing there. And I couldn't, I was having the hardest time getting underneath the defenses of view of other, like so angry that you don't, you know, you, it was a, a it was an abandonment theme, which started in childhood with a right. parent dying very young, but because they drank themselves, they were an alcoholic and they basically died because of alcohol related death. They saw it as you didn't love me enough to, Right. change this bad behavior to come be with me. I wasn't worth the struggle for you to come be with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so still ever since then, it's, it's really hard to get under because the defenses are so strong and so tight. And on some level, I know the client is able to cognitively know I'm, I should be worthy of love, but yet internally just like won't let me near that part that says I'm so terrified. I'm not really worthy. And this comes out on, you need to prove to me that I'm worth fighting for constantly, constantly. And then, of course, then the partner feels like I'm running an obstacle course. <laughs> well, many times um, in this sticky way that st shame sticks to other primary emotion, the doorway into it is often through sadness and grief. Mm -hmm. And when we've attended to the sadness and grief enough that there's enough constitution, enough emotional regulation, enough comfort from others that it's not so risky to go into this place that says, am I broken? What's wrong with me? And then even un and then this fear, what if it's true? Oh my goodness. What if this thing I've always believed is actually, if I open it up to you, what if it's really true? Right. So we often have to really work on that alliance and do a lot of support around the grief mm -hmm. and the sadness. And so that there's some level of I, you're here and I'm getting comfort. So I'm getting some new input that I'm not terrible, that somebody is present. You're with me. I'm not so alone that I can start to take some risks to have those other feelings emerge that are that really, if I just believed it was true, I would give up. If I, if I let myself believe that feeling of brokenness um, and that my needs don't matter, I would just give up. Mm. So it takes a lot of um, comforting, a lot of being aware of the sadness, sharing of the sadness and having a new experience. Because you're, in your case, right, you're describing someone who lost her mother, who was there to comfort her. It was actually a male, it was a male figure, and of course, every male in this person's life ever since then has been a, everybody's a loser, or stupid, like, you know, and it's been a nonstop obstacle course, prove, prove to me that you'll fight for me, and it's that super high reactivity getting underneath that view of others, something's wrong with you that you won't come after me, 
really hard to tap into. I actually found out underneath it's that you're afraid you're not worthy, but getting to that under that high reactivity is so hard when that shame is so strong. Yep, no doubt. That takes, it takes a lot of work. And our couples and clients are so courageous. You know, human beings are so resilient. Mm -hmm. And given, given um, enough um, support and consistency that we can actually have these really deeply held and unconscious beliefs change is really huge, you know, that we can start to realize that our needs that haven't been met or needs that were responded to with anger or maybe a flooding or intrusive parent or punishment or just abandonment, that the, that, that emotional dilemma that we had as a child you know, the solution for that was I'm bad and I can't count on anybody, you know, it must be me. So that we can really as adults recover and have this kind of resiliency that, you know, that we're driven to find a way through this dilemma is so huge. Um, and then we know that, of course, the deeper the emotional experiencing, the deeper the emotional engagement, the better the outcomes come. But Many times we have couples come, or clients, if we're seeing them individually, who have been stuck in this place for decades, right? And so maybe it takes six or nine months or a year or two years, but that two years relative to 18 years of growing up and having this, these same messages embedded over and over is, um, you know, really amazing, speaks to our resiliency. That's That people even who have huge trauma backgrounds can uh, do recover at all is just really speaks to, it's so heartening for what it says to us as humans and about our need for connection and how resilient we can be. Yeah, I love, I love what I hear you saying. You know, you said this beautiful thing about attending to the sadness and the grief and that's, that's not something I've heard before, so I think that's really beautiful, and it, and it makes a lot of sense, too, to really attend to the, the other emotions that are stuck to the shame, and as you kind of <laughs> unstick the different pieces, eventually you'll be able to get to that shame, and I love, you know, what you said about transforming, you know, those old messages that they've grown up believing about themselves and helping them to heal, you know, from from broken to bonding, you know, and, right. you know, that's something that I want to ask too is when it comes to, I guess maybe this would be part of stage two, when you, when a partner, so when someone can identify shame, right, I've had the shameful message that came from my parents, let's, you know, let's say my parents told me I was bad in some way, and even though my partner is telling me I'm good and I'm amazing, you find people that have that shame, again, it's that blocker. Like, I hear it, but it, it just kind of beads off the surface. It doesn't sink into the roots where we get nourished. So yes. how, so would we just kind of keep... Well, it's a mixed signal. I mean, it's maybe not be a mixed signal from the partner, but we get, mm -hmm. it, it can't kind of stay coherent inside of us mm -hmm. because we have this reappraisal that says... I'm bad, worthless, unlovable. You know, I'm a mistake versus I made a mistake. Um, I'll never be good enough. So the more you try to love me out of my experience, the more it can confirm I'm broken. <laughs> See? Uh, so I'll tell you a, an experience from my own life. Um, it's uh, Maybe this isn't a good experience to share just because it dates the the time of year, the season, because we're doing this in December, it's around Christmas time, and it's a Christmas example. Um, so when I was a young mother, we went through, I went through a time of severe poverty, really severe poverty. I wasn't working, I hadn't finished school, I had young children, um, my now ex-husband was unemployed, severe poverty. poverty. And someone in our neighborhood started to do um, dropped gifts on our porch, right? So my children would have Christmas. They wouldn't have had any Christmas otherwise. 
And, um, and I thought I was hiding it so well, you know? And, and so these gifts that came didn't say to me, well, someone, people are good in the world and they're, they care about us and they're trying to bring us some joy, right? What the gift said to me, you're not doing a very good job hiding it. They're taking pity on you. See, it proves how bad and needy you are. And so what happens in our couples is a similar thing, is that partners know. I know my partner's struggling with um, lack of confidence or not feeling good enough about themselves or have a negative self-esteem. Those are the other words that would use for a view of self, right? I know that, so I'm going to try to prop them up. I'm going to compliment them a lot. I'm going to, like, I can just love that out of them. The problem is it doesn't feel like acceptance to the partner, and the message the partner gets is it proves I'm broken or you wouldn't have to work so hard at loving me and trying to get me to get this new message in. Hmm. Right. So what would an acceptance-based message sound like in that case, like with your case? But so if we use your, your example, and, and thank you so much for sharing such a beautiful, vulnerable example. It's it really beautiful. Well, fortunately, that was, you know, some, some drops of goodness that, well, I couldn't accept at the time, and it just inflamed my not good enough experience, you know, <laughs> and that I better do a better job about hiding um, my need. Uh, over the years, of course, I can look back on that and go, oh, my goodness, that was the sweetest thing ever. I can see the caring in it. You know, I wouldn't want anyone to go, oh, my goodness, you know, let's not try to love and serve and give to people in need because they're going to feel worse about it. It really was my problem that I couldn't accept it. So we want to translate that into the therapy room, mm -hmm. right? Into the therapy room when we see a client, um, the partners of the one that has a lot of shame proneness will have tried to kind of love their partner out of feeling bad. <laughs> and and I'm feeling we're probably aiding in that process. If we're not understanding, I think we're aiding in that exactly. process. Exactly. So we have to be aware because, and at some point the partner like just starts to hate the shame, you know, there you go, feeling bad about yourself again. And many times that's about the time they come into us, right? But before <laughs> then, when they got together, they knew this about their partner. I haven't ever met couples in a complex relationship who weren't actually drawn to some of the complexities of their partner and the depth of their despair, the depth of their experience. There was some something around that that they shared. But at some point it twists because now instead of bringing something that, something that brings us together, it feels like it's something that keeps us apart. So we do want to pay attention to that, you know, that when when the shame comes up or the partner starts to talk about the shame and their sweetie starts to go, oh, you don't have to feel that way. You're really lovable. You're so beautiful. Here, take the gift of my love. That that can actually land as rejection. Hmm. Right? It doesn't land as, uh, well, because what does acceptance look like? If I'm risking to open up and say I feel really broken, what does acceptance look like? Acceptance looks like, oh, thank you for that gift. Thank you. I appreciate it. Acceptance doesn't look like, oh, you shouldn't have given me that gift. Mm. Oh, you get it's too much. It's too big of a thing. Or, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You worked too hard at doing that. Or, mm. You know, acceptance doesn't look like sometimes, even though it's nice and sweet and not angry, when a partner says, you don't have to feel that way. I, I love you. Let my love in. Now, that can be a very soft protest and a, in, the, in the meta process, a uh, rejection message. It's not the same as, yeah. oh, you're letting me know that you really struggle with how you feel about yourself. Let me see if I can understand that. Let me see if I can stay coherent around why you might feel that way instead of going, oh, no, I'm not loving you enough or you wouldn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and okay, so let's go into that because I'm, as you're saying all this, I'm realizing I did something the wrong way. <laughs> shame! <laughs> My therapist, shame! Um, you know, and, and as I said, I aided in this not knowing, but it was the first time that I'd seen the shame come out, and this was in one of my clients yeah. with parenting shame, you know, uh, also very similar to yours, a lot of poverty when they were younger, and so the parents were very shaming about them needing help, and so now that they're right. re-blending, you know, and she shared this, you know, what holds me back from having this intimate, you know, we're trying to deepen our connection, and parenting is one thing we don't share, and part of it is because I see myself as a bad parent, I'm broken, and she was able to talk about how her, you know, parent told her that she was a bad mom. And, and just all the shame came forward, all the sadness. And the partner was like, I don't see you as a bad parent. I think you're actually terrific. You have a wonderful kid. And she was like, yeah, but, you know, like I could just get beating off the surface. And I was like, okay, something's hard. Something about, you know, I know this is a new message. This isn't what your parents you know, but I was aiding in, oh, he's giving you this new, <laughs> this new view of yourself. Why can't you take it in? So what could we do differently in that situation? <laughs> well, first I want to say it's really hard, even for us as therapists, to go towards someone else's shame. If we connect to it with empathy, we're going to feel it. Mm -hmm. too and that it can be very difficult to co-regulate someone else's shame without us losing our footing so we have to be you know clear about what we're trying to do and it helps so you asking this question is great because it will help you next time that you can have this more solid footing because this is why the partner also wants let me just love the shame out of you here take my good feeling and replace your bad feeling. And like, I think let, it, yeah, let's yeah. actually get rid of your bad feeling. Yeah. So, and and this therapist meta process, it. And it, so in a meta process, what that says is something's wrong with me for having this bad feeling. Right? Okay. That's uh, because oh, I think I are, yeah, I think we're trained the same way that you know, replace their negative view of self with a more positive view of self that comes from their new, stronger, more attachment figure. But I don't think that's right. It, not, not at least in the, the micro steps that you're talking. No, it emerges. It emerges through a new experience. Yeah. And so, what new experience do they need to have? Is an experience of, I'm with you. I get you. Of course, you feel bad about yourself. If I grew up. You know, with my mother blaming me and telling me I was bad and wrong and scolding me every time my child did something instead of supporting me to learn how to be a better parent, I would feel bad about myself too, right? So we want, we kind of want to, hold. yeah, that. let's just try. Let me give you my experience. You take that <laughs> instead of, oh, yeah, let me take on board your experience and accept it and be with you. It's so hard to do. Hold it. So hold it. Kind of. It sounds kind of like we're going to treat it similarly to the way we treat anger. Is we have to meet it first before we shift down into something else. Absolutely. We're just meeting them where they are. It's a, it's a feeling. It's not a disaster, right? It's not a catastrophe here. We're just sharing, exploring it, understanding it. And I'm right here with you. Yeah. This is why you feel your, or, or maybe I don't get it yet. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit more about how it is that you see yourself as so broken. I may not quite get it, but once, but I have, to, I need to try to get it so I can validate it. Um, be with it. Right. Be with the sticky other, the other emotions it's sticking to. Um, so that it becomes organized so we can assemble it. And when people have that sense of your, it's perfectly normal where where you come from, where we're at, what I'm experiencing, it makes sense. It's organized. You're not with me. You're not against me. You're with me, right? Because when we think about the danger signal, simple. It's really simple. With me, against me, good, bad. You know, changing me, accepting me. Mm -hmm. So when 
that we can do affect assembly around it and organize it and say, oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. No wonder this is how you make sense out of who you are, that, that you, no wonder you end up feeling broken. It's very hard to keep another point of view when you have, when this and this lines up and tells you that. Mm -hmm. so, I like yeah, we very much agree with That's it. good. I like that you just said it's hard to hold another point of view because that is what their partner wants them to hold is this beautiful, more positive view of themselves and they can't hold it yet because we haven't yet held the old one. And I, I think as therapists, right. And I may probably not everyone, but at least me. <laughs> and, you know, it seems like we've been trained to kind of rush through, like, you know, we're not necessarily afraid of it, but it's like, oh, oh, shame. I know how to fix that. We're going to love it out of you. And I'm going to give right. you this beautiful, oh, I see you. It's so amazing. And you're a wonderful parent. And doesn't that feel good? And they're like, uh, it's not really sticking. It's not overriding the old message. And we forget it's like we're rushing through the tango steps, I think, in that, and we forget to, as they're sharing all this pain and sadness, I don't know why, like, it seems so important to, to stay with the pain and sadness all the other times, but for some reason around this, it's like, let's rush through it and get to the healing part, <laughs> and that's not effective, so we got to stay. Well, and you know, remember the action tendency of shame is to hide, mm. so it's hard for us too, to kind of come towards it and touch it and not lose our perspective where we're at, that we're solid and we can see that they don't feel so solid and that we can, you know, put one of our feet in their world and not lose where we are mm -hmm. and really be kind of with them. I'm remembering this other thing from poverty times um, where this other neighbor, dif different year, another neighbor, um, Set, saw these circumstances and said, um, we want to take you and your family out to dinner, right? Uh, or will you go to dinner with us or something? So we said, okay, you know, they were very nice to, that we'd been at their house and, um, and they were very wealthy. So we thought, okay, that's really nice. So went out to dinner. Only thing was when we were there at this dinner, and they went to, we took us to this fancy restaurant. When I started to look at the bill, all I could think of was that would pay my whole month of light bill. That would, you know, I couldn't enjoy the food. So, you know, we, when we're offering, like as a therapist, I got all this love for you. Your partner has all this love for you. You know, just take it in. Oh, the way, and it, it brings up this grief and this extra pain because it doesn't actually meet the need. The need is, can I share myself with you? Do you get where I'm at? Can you meet me where I am? Right. That's so good and so true. And, I, and it just really brought to my mind how I was missing that step. And, you know, not really feeling like I was losing my footing, but just somehow this, this old therapist training pops in that says love give them all this love that's the antidote to shame and i didn't realize i was kind of covering it you know hi helping to hide the shame instead of holding it and holding all that beautiful pain because it, it was just right there all the pain all the sadness was right there and so what i what i heard you say is maybe we could help the partner and act like an accept do an acceptance enactment like thank you for sharing i right. see how hard this was and i get it and yeah i can hear you i do get it it's not how i see you but i get why you see yourself that way mm -hmm. so partners can have a two-part response to it which says, I can accept you and I don't actually have to lose myself and my own perspective, my own experience of you at the same time. So do you think, so I know, I know we don't leave the cycle work behind when we get into stage two. And oftentimes when I find that shame pieces come up as those blocks to bonding and, and having deeper, more intimate conversations, when we have something like this and we hold the pain from the shame and we do the acceptance enactment, would this be something that we probably work up like a bring it out into this is a place where we get stuck in not being able to bond or get closer this holds us back 
and run through that if, probably maybe even a few sessions before we try to really get into the new can you take in your partner saying that they you know how they see you what that would probably be well, it kind of emerges across time and across you know stage one and stage two because this these two parts of the partner being able to hear instead of just triggering their the negative cycle like you don't accept my love or yeah if you just behave better you know like because partners can get really reactive around the shame too so as they start to de-escalate you get this clear two-part response where I do want more I want you to see I want you to receive my love I I want you to see how I see you and I'm starting to get what happens to you all right the sadness the shame the fears that you have I'm starting to get that and then of course as you go into stage two um, we go deeper into that. We're starting to separate out that the stickiness of the emotion. We can do that more easily in stage two. And the research and withdrawal reengagement, not that withdrawals are the only ones that have shame, but it's really interesting that the research and withdrawal reengagement often goes from sadness through shame to fear to the fear that and we know the fear is the real initial organizer, right? I'm really, like, I'm afraid I'm going to get rejected or intruded upon or abandoned or left alone. We just get down through, you know, that I'm alone in the world. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, we kind of do that as we go deeper. Um, I love and they're that. able to tolerate being deeper. So we kind of go through those emotions, sad, sad, shame, and fear. And in stage one, we're, we're kind of putting those into the cycle. Yes, of course, you feel sad and alone, and you end up feeling bad about yourself, and you're afraid that no one will ever be with you. You know, we'll, we kind of will do those as reflections without actually thinking, oh, there's three elements of this emotional experience that I'm reflecting as I do that. Um, as you're saying this, what's kind of coming up for me, I'm thinking as you're saying about you know, taking the, the sticky parts and processing the, the, the different parts that stick. And as stage two, we'll be able to get to the deepest parts of those. Um, and I'm thinking back to my other... We can you know, much more clearly. Yeah. Like, yes. I know you, I know this broken feeling also comes up and you get afraid. Can we just stay with the sadness right now? Yeah. I'm so thinking... They're de-escalated enough. They can actually kind of walk around a little bit more without without getting flooded by these other experiences yeah. as much. For some reason, I feel like it's easier to identify shame in a withdrawer than it is in a pursuer because the pursuers bury it under blame. And I'm wondering how could we, so I'm thinking to what you said earlier about, um, you know, I have a, a, quite a few blamers, pursuers, we're not gonna call them blamers, right? <laughs> who with that, that high reactivity, the, they set up like the, the tests prove that you love me. I'm going to set up all these tests and traps and I want to see you fight your way through it. Like I used a Shrek analogy actually, like she was the princess in the tower and there's this moat and the dragon and you know, all these different things that tasks that have to be completed first to fight your way through to prove that I can rescue the princess. And and so they get really angry when their partner doesn't pass these tests, when they don't prove it. And I know underneath it, it's that fear, that fear of if you don't prove it, then maybe it means you don't love me. But underneath it, it's, you know, it goes back to view itself. How do you start to... Well, they always, they go together. Right. They very much go together. So one moment... I can feel, I can go see, you don't love me, something's wrong with you, because I'm lovable. And then the next moment it can be, oh wait, maybe you don't love me because I'm not lovable. Maybe it's really about me. So those two fears often just run, and with pursuers, right, more, more emotion. Mm -hmm. So it's, it can be hard to land on one or the other. They kind of V-tail into each other. So we're just being with them whichever direction that they go. Thank so you. I can stay with you of self. Yeah, you you feel unlovable when your partner doesn't, your sweetie doesn't show up for you. 
you actually end up feeling unlovable. Yes, I do, but they don't know how to love me anyway, right? So I can own it for a moment, and then, oh, the, as that pain kind of comes in and the fear comes in louder, then it goes, wait, what if they about you. own it? How do you unstickify or, like, start to tease apart that that reactivity and get to that fear of I'm unlovable. Well, so then we're kind of working stage one work again, right? And we're not necessarily going with or not intending in stage one to reorganize view of self. That's it. That informs us about why, how and why they cope the way they cope. Mm -hmm. It's only when we can actually stay and land in the deeper experiences that that's malleable to change because they're having new emotional experiences. So again, we're just using that information as to what keeps them coping the way that they cope. So if the, when I'm going through the process of emotion and doing affect assembly, when your partner does this, the danger signal to you is, oh no, here I'm alone, right? I'm alone, and, and what do you do with that? Well, then I, you know, I, I go, ah, I gotta move into fight. My body prepares to go forward, and I am very can be very sad that I'm alone, and very mad that I am, and I don't know, sometimes I think I'm not lovable, but most of the time I think, why don't you just show up for me? Of course, I try to do better, but yeah, I'm going to try to keep getting through to you because that's my best way to cope with this initial, uh-oh, you don't get me, and I'm here by myself. And that my action tendency is to under-regulate emotion. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. I'm thinking that... It seems pretty obvious, even in that high reactivity, that there is that fear, that fear. Even if I'm blaming you for not pursuing me, there's that fear. And, and as you're saying this, I guess I'm thinking that maybe a way to say that would be, um, so if your partner doesn't pursue you, what would that mean? What, what would that be like? Yeah, that's right. So, and I, and so I guess the more that you try to get through and the less your partner hears you, the more that leaves you feeling bad about you right? yeah. and mad at your partner for yeah. having because you won't want to feel bad about you or your or your partner for that matter right yeah so we know those always go together because they self reinforce and because it's attachment mm -hmm. so I can't you know feel like you're not coming towards me and still feel good about me that just that's why I get so mad at one of the reasons why I get so mad at you. I don't want to be left alone in this experience. And we do know as couples distress goes across time that it goes from we have a problem, you know, Houston, we have a problem in the relationship to no, there's something wrong with you. Then to, oh, it must be me because I'm taking it or because I stay or what's the matter with me. So it has this progression across time as distress increases so yeah. it's all, all also part of our assessment and we part of the context that we hold them of course as long as you've been fighting this of course that you you know you got to wonder sometimes why why am i still here fighting this when i just it doesn't look like you care about me at all yeah and um so we start think pursuers will start thinking I'm crazy. What's the matter with me? Yeah, you know, but but wait, I'm gonna hold on because one we have had a connection at times I've had it with you. I know it can be there right? And I've made a commitment and we are building life together. So come on, let's just correct it so yeah, that's why it's helpful to know where we are in the therapy process because we want to pay attention to what our therapeutic goal is at the time, whether we're de-escalating or we're actually starting to work deep enough and they can tolerate that deeper emotional experience. And, um, or they can go there without being flooded 
by it because lots of times people in stage one will drop in way too deep and they don't have the scaffolding, the organization mm -hmm. around it. They haven't had that emotion assembled in a way that they can, you know, kind of hold on to it. Right. So that's why the map is so helpful. If it, it was only emotion without a map, um, right. you know, it's a little more simple, but people are complex and so we need the combination of the, uh, the attachment affect and the map, where are we on it and what are we trying to accomplish? Because it is a step-by-step -step progression, not step-by-step -step in the way of EFT steps and stages, but how we learn things as people, you know, is new experience, a little experience here, a little experience here, right? Um, and we learn things in a progressive manner. You know, as you were talking, you mentioned scaffolding, and I felt like a total idiot because I think I just finally understood scaffolding. <laughs> so, because I've heard therapists, I've heard you guys use the term scaffolding, and I understand the concept of scaffolding, but I guess I thought we're thinking of us as the scaffold, and you're talking about organization, and I'm like, Oh, that makes more sense. Organization is the scaffold. Uh -huh. <laughs> kind of like, um, like, um, like experiences, um, like a well, like an oil well, you know? Mm -hmm. And you know you can go down and get the, the oil. It's there. And we could go down really fast and it's going to burst. Right? Yeah. It, could, it could just blow. And it can blow out. If, if the scaffolding isn't in and around that well, it just blows it all out and it, it just shoots. There's nothing there to catch it. There's no way to contain it, no way to make it useful. And so in part of that cycle development is kind of like putting the scaffolding in around the well, the container to keep it safe. Yeah, I'm thinking too, you know, when you go into deep emotion and you haven't made sense of your own emotion or why it happens or what it means, it's it's like taking a swine off swine swan dive off a cliff. You know, that's a far right. way to go. But if you have a way to make sense of it, then it doesn't feel like this huge plunge. It feels like okay, I can I can walk a little bit out onto the platform first, and that's yes. And then we don't have this. I mean, you can't always prevent clients from not having those too deep, too fast experiences, but we can do it more and more yeah. uh, helpful, more helpful about not going too deep, too fast and keeping a safe container so that there's not this, you know, shame, vulnerability hangover, the shame kickback for, oh, wow, I just, you know, I collapsed in session today. Now, see, I shouldn't have let myself feel after all, you know, this way it comes back and kicks yeah. back on people when they've either blown up or got overwhelmed. Right? Yes, and, you know, I just, more therapist shame. I just got the concept of uh, scaffolding, guys. <laughs> Even though the term's been used frequently before, I just finally got it. And I'm thinking, I like what you said, that the hangover, which I've heard one of my couples described and, and, you know, in trauma, they, the trauma training, they taught us to, you know, help clients talk about self care after their sessions, because it's not always possible to walk out with a smile on your face. But I've had clients talk about kind of the hangover, the, the after session meltdown. And, you know, as much as we try to come back and tie a bow on it and lift them back up at the end of session, sometimes you've stirred the pot more than anybody realizes and they go home and stuff starts to come back up to the surface and they don't know what to do with it. It's like, <sighs> so I love how you right. described it that way. Great. Well, good. Well, I hope that's helpful. Yeah. So, oh yeah, my goodness. We all learn concepts new and differently as we go along, right? That's yeah. just, that's again, it's, great example of persisting and learning and being uh, sticking with things and then we learn we learn we that's can things continue to be new we learn different aspects of them yes and and the antidote to my therapist shame is my exposure by doing these <laughs> because guys you know even as much as you know, our clients digest the cycle in different layers and levels. That's why we repeat it, repeat it. And even though we may be certified or a supervisor or probably even a trainer, doesn't mean that we're not learning anymore and 
you know, terms or, or concepts that were used before that we, we got will probably start to click on different levels. And so a lot of times when I'm doing these videos and I'm hearing you guys describe these things, things are clicking differently and more deeply. And it's like, oh, you know, also as my clients get more complex, some of these things that didn't really resonate for the not as complex couples, it's like, oh, 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 <laughs> you know, so yes, Maybe I've, I've heard some other therapists talk about their therapist shame. I should have known that or they're kicking themselves. That seemed like such a simple concept. Why didn't they get it? Look, I got it too, guys. Like I just had that ding dong moment <laughs> of our understanding scaffolding. So thank you for holding my therapist shame. <laughs> You're welcome. It's great to have the transparency to model some safety and collaboration mm -hmm. right? and that and have empathy with each other and develop more and more safety because we, shame is tricky and it's sticky and we want to be able to work with it in the cycle and, you know, deeper into stage two. And we've got to be able to ourselves mm -hmm. recognize our own shadow, our own shame yeah. and help bring it to light. Right? So, if you, so we don't get stuck in the darkness of feeling yeah. bad and broken. Because our own, our own clients aren't the only ones feeling shame, even though we're therapists, we still feel shame. And sometimes it's around our EFT skills, and we might be too embarrassed to share a question on Facebook or the listserv because we're immersed in our own shame. Like, I should have known this is a silly question. I can't reach out and ask everybody. They expect me to know things. <sighs> so take a risk expose your expose yourself and that's you know be, be prepared to be validated and shown empathy <laughs> <laughs> but i love so let's tie a bow on on what we covered today because there's so much really good stuff that really digested on a new level and i love you know what you talked about when shame pops up in stage one you know how to put that into the cycle and, and recognize the other emotions that are attached to shame and using those in the cycle and helping to organize and scaffold that. So as we go into stage two and we can get to those deeper, softer, and more vulnerable emotions attached to view of self and the deeper meanings, because, you know, without that scaffolding, it's not going to be safe to go down that deep. And oftentimes, right. that's where the shame can lie is deep, deep down in there. So I'm kind of using this to go down deep. <laughs> so you get into stage two, and when that shame pops up, it's so important to be able to stay and hold the emotions and don't rush into the, here's this new loving dialogue and view of self that you should take on and just absorb because you're really awesome. And <laughs> I want you to see yourself as awesome. We've got to hold the brokenness and sit with the brokenness and that is huge and that that makes sense you know when they're hearing their partner validate their pain but not really accepting you know that part of them that feels broken and where that came from and saying oh yeah that totally makes sense to me now yeah it's it's one of those you know like, it's like people have this layer of rain -X. it's that stuff people put on their cars that prevents the, the water spots it it lands but it just beads off the surface it doesn't seep in like roots to a plant you know that need that nourishment which is love empathy but you know we have to get through that first barrier and acceptance i so huge i love what you said about acceptance is key that's so new i i don't know how i missed that but so new and you know becca just thank you so much for honoring us with your beautiful story from your own personal experience and it, i just had so much love for you in that moment so i mean i love you anyway but <laughs> just you know it invoked this part of me that just felt so warm and soft and wanted to give you a hug <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing that with us and you know is there anything else that you think is really important to make sure that we touch on before we wrap up for today well I, maybe just this image i think it's used it's been used before it's not necessarily a new image but i've always loved it about the the japanese pottery the broken pottery that's repaired with gold the kintsugi, that to take something broken and you see the broken places and how they fit together 
and the repair is made with gold so that the broken places aren't hidden. It's, they actually make the pottery more beautiful. Mm-hmm. And the things that we do recover from the things that we've been hurt by and broken in life and that have made us stronger also make us more beautiful as we bring them into the light and we have that healing and that recovery. And I think that's a beautiful thing that we as EFT therapists offer to our clients that we work with, our couples and our individuals and families. That's a beautiful image. Thank you for sharing that, Becca. And I I think it's interesting that they use gold because, you know, I like you pointed out, they it obviously they're not using super glue or <laughs> invisible glue to hide the brokenness. They the right. gold makes it stand out, but also I think of gold because my husband and I are fans. Made it more valuable. Made right. it more valuable than and an heirloom and an right. art piece, really. Well, and I, and I think my husband and I are fans of the Gilded Era type of furniture, and a lot of stuff was gilded and crusted with gold. And it, it's like a way to honor, you know, it's, it's, it's like... It amplifies the beauty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, like, we're not using super glue. We're not using some other, like, cheap glue. We're, we're dousing it in gold. So it's like we're honoring and adding value to the brokenness. And I love that idea of adding value to the brokenness because the brokenness really does shape our lives in very important ways. And to see that it's valuable and not something ugly and dirty that we need to hide away and get rid of. It's it really, yeah, beautiful. It's awesome. <laughs> we'll have to, if you have like any images, maybe you can share some of that on your website and people can look it up and uh, we can all post that in our offices now or get ourselves a little example. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> So tell everyone, where can they find you? And you offer a workshop on shame, right? Yep, I have a workshop um, on shame. And I'll be in Tampa in February um, of 2019 and uh, different places around the country and the world, I guess, offering that workshop on occasion. And you can find that at um, my website, Dr. Becca Jorgensen have all kinds of information there at tryeft.org also. Um, usually when I'm sponsored to go someplace else, we also try to list my training schedule where that's going to be in other places at tryeft.org. Um, so that's a that's certainly where you can find me or at Hold Me Tight for Therapists where I have a separate website particularly for doing workshops for therapists and their partners who want to come and do EFT as a workshop for their own relationship and learn it from the inside out. Excellent. So drrebeccajorgensen.com or tryeft.org. And yeah. um, your training schedule is posted as well as resources. I know you have some wonderful forms for therapists and training videos that folks can are available for purchase. Are those on your website as well? Those are on my website, and also if you wanted to do training with me or supervision with me, I do online supervision groups, both beginning and advanced, and those are available to find as um, as well as intensive couple therapy. So couples will come to me in an intensive format, and then I work with their therapist to do the follow-up and the finish work um, after the intensive. So we have different intensive programs that are available for couples. And I am a fan of Becca's intensives. Actually, I had her come do an intensive with one of my couples before a big training, and it was really awesome. It it was so helpful. So guys, if you have a chance to do an intensive with Becca with your clients, it's so amazing. Um, so excellent. And then people can actually email you and contact you through your website. Perfect. Yep. Very easy. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And I will put links to your websites in the description for the video. So it's easier for people to find and they can access and, and get your stuff. Yep. And our social media peeps who like to do social media, of course, can find me at, um, EFT doc. Um, on Facebook and Twitter. Excellent. And you have a Facebook group. So guys, if you're on Facebook, make sure that you join the group led by 
uh, Dr. Rebecca Jorgensen. It's uh, emotionally focused couples therapy or just emo emotionally focused therapy? Yeah, emotionally focused therapy group. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Jorgensen, for being on our show. And we just want to thank all the viewers for, you know, subscribing and watching the videos. We're getting some great feedback and always, we're always open to suggestions on topics or, you know, uh, really good questions that you'd like to see addressed in a video. So make sure that you subscribe and contact me on Facebook if you need. But uh, just make sure that you hit subscribe because more videos are on the way.